Hello, everyone, and welcome to another Find My Past Friday. Uh, it's a wonderful day, very uh, warm, uh, considering, uh, in uh, uh, Scotland at least, although we know it's cold in other parts around the world. We've seen some uh, people on the news uh, with very terrible weather, but we can stay indoors and we can do family history and keep ourselves safe. So uh, uh, hopefully there are plenty of you joining and uh, I look forward to seeing where you're all tuning in from. Uh, today, as ever on a Friday, is a uh, more relaxed session where we'll talk about all kinds of different things, new records and more, anything that you can think of, uh, pop it in the chat, say hello, uh, talk to all of your fellow genealogists, family historians, um, and uh, we'll see what we can get through. Uh, we've got some wonderful new records to talk about. And we have other uh, great things that will come up as we go. Uh, I know on Wednesday uh, we had a, a, a great chat uh, question and answer session and uh, it seems that everyone had fun. But uh, did anyone find anything new? Did anyone uh, have, get inspired? Did anyone think of something from that conversation and uh, discover a new record, anything they can think of? Uh, that would be wonderful to hear if we can uh, see that. And uh, I think it was uh, so successful. I know we do them semi-regularly. I think we're going to move to a more regular session of those, maybe once a month or so. So uh, look out for that and uh, you'll hear some news soon uh, if you uh, aren't sick of the sight of me already. Um, so I see um, Heather is saying hello from Edinburgh and uh, as me as well. And Ellie, who is in the comments, she is... Um, uh, there too. So there are many of us. Uh, Ian is here. Uh, he said he enjoyed last night's talk. That was for the Renfrewshire Family History Society. I was there last night um, and uh, talking about our Scottish family history records. Uh, wonderful um, societies all over the country uh, work with Find My Past and uh, we publish their records and it's great to talk about the great work they do and uh, put them online and, and all the things and the ways to search those records and collections too. So it was a pleasure to be there. I look forward to many more over the coming months and years. Um, I see uh, people, Margaret is saying that she's from Cambridgeshire and she said it's a great site. Uh, I don't know if you mean that Farmer Pass is a great site or Cambridgeshire is a great site, but I'll take it as uh, as both and uh, say they both are. Um, Pauline is saying, as usual, it's wet and cold in Belfast. And we've got a colleague who you might have uh, seen this week, Mary McKee, who's in Belfast, and um, she's been uh, avoiding the snow as well. So she's been getting the rain, but no snow. So I think maybe you're lucky in some ways and lucky in others. Uh, Sylvie's also saying the weather is, is uh, miserable in West Yorkshire. It's uh, fascinating how um, we always uh, go back to the weather. Maybe it's a British thing, but um, we uh, always, the first question is always what the weather is like, but it is interesting to see. Uh, I see Karen and she has a McSporran from Renfrewshire and you couldn't get a more Scottish name than McSporran. That's definitely something that I would look for in records and I do love a, a rare name. Um, my uh, relative Salisbury Whisker is one of my go-to uh, persons to look for in any family history record collection that covers because of the uh, the wonder of having a name like that to find. And I see some other people from Ireland, um, lots of other people, someone from uh, Janine from Utah as well. So we've got an international audience. I think I saw um, some more people from around the world as well. Uh, Ros is from Massachusetts. We're having a 36-hour snowstorm. And uh, Yes, there's quite a lot of you. So I think we're we're about ready to get started. I see everyone in all these different places, and that's a wonderful thing. And um, so uh, let's talk about the big thing. First of all, our new records for this week, because that's why you're all here and why you love Fire My Pass so much, because we're the only website that releases new records every single week. And so this week, some really interesting uh, records from a variety of places. Uh, that's what I like about these new releases. Sometimes you'll get something big that covers uh, you know, something in great detail. Sometimes you'll get uh, smaller collections that have detail for a particular subsection of the population or the community. And those are, if you, if you have your ancestor in this smaller collection, that's the, the, the perfect record for you. And so each record is someone's relative and they all matter and every week and, uh, you know, it might be your chance, but there's some really good ones here that, uh, you know, will hopefully help so many different people, wide variety of people. So I'm really excited. First of all, we have some additions to our marriage license collection. We have a collection with 100,000 new additions in the Diocese of Durham. Uh, so that's uh, right in the north of the country there. 
they go all the way back to the 16th century um and uh, the collection itself has records that go back to the 1100s so marriage licenses are quite interesting we've got 15 english counties in that collection uh london lancashire suffolk exeter lincoln yorkshire and many many more um but those marriage licenses are for those people who had a bit of money or wanted to pay a fee for example and they could avoid having bands called which is the usual way that weddings went you had three weeks of uh, does anyone know any reason why these people shouldn't marry and if no one said there was a reason uh, then uh, then they could go ahead and do it. But a license meant you could forgo that because, of course, the rich would never lie. Um, they say there's definitely no reason why we shouldn't marry and uh, they can go straight ahead and do it. So those licenses are really interesting. It can give you a bit of an idea and a clue to your ancestors' social status. It might lead you with these details of their occupation and more um, to other records. So they're really, really useful. And so over 100,000 new ones I mean it really is a, a place to look and a, another excuse to take a look at those great collections because you'll get things like the father's name as well of these people so you might know if you've got a handful of records of these marriages that might be yours then uh, that's one to look at and when you do look at marriages in this sort of period and um, don't forget to make a note of whether it says those marriages are by bands or by license because that will tell you what kind of record you need to look for if you need to look for bands books or licenses bands books um don't survive as much uh, and original licenses are very hard to come by but the uh, the license records that exist and survive are um great to find and they're really really useful Amanda said already that marriage licenses are fantastic. Sold a few brick walls with them. I've got a um, uh, a wonderful uh, one from Cheshire that uh, proved of these two individuals which one was my ancestor uh, and the fact that they came from uh, Wales to marry uh, from Flintshire. So it really helped. So it is very, very useful. And uh, don't discount them. Try and have a look as well and see what you can find. And uh, so uh, let's see what else we've got. We've got uh, licensed victuallers from Cambridgeshire. So I know we mentioned Cambridgeshire a little bit earlier. Uh, I hope you've got ancestors from there as well. Um, anyone uh, who has a pub landlord in the family, uh, they can take a look at this and they can find not only the establishment they ran, uh, where it was and, and when it was run and all a little bit more details from your ancestors. They came from the Cambridgeshire and Huntington Family History Society. They go 1764 to 1828. Uh, another transcribed collection from one of those great societies we work with. And uh, then uh, they'll give you details of that alehouse, everything in there. Uh, it might be a tavern, might be an inn. And then whoever provides the surety, uh, you'll also get details. So you might find a connected person as well, whoever's paying for this license. Uh, so uh, that's another avenue to research. So we like those occupational records. They are very, very interesting. Uh, then uh, we have something from the United States, uh, the inspection role of Negroes, 1783. So these are uh, black loyalists who were evacuated from New York in 1783 by the British uh, when they lost the War of Independence. Uh, these were those who, who left and, and uh, decided they didn't want to stay in this country. Um, so um, it's important to note that these are uh, using some terms that we probably might not use today, uh, but history is, is what it is. And uh, when these records are online and scanned and visible and things, then it, it means that we can uh, tell those stories uh, no matter how uh, difficult they may be. And uh, of course, this may be uh, some detail of someone's ancestor here. Um, and the records are quite detailed. Um, you'll find out if someone's a former slave, uh, whether they're free man, uh, and you'll have details of their name, their age, um, their physical description, which vessel they were evacuated on, lots and lots of details. So those are a really interesting collection as well from a, a, a lesser known part of history. So that's quite interesting. Um, I see Ian saying he lives in Denbyshire near the Flintshire border. So I've got some uh, Wrexham ancestors and uh, I definitely uh, may have to pick your brains at some point. But um, there's uh, also a, a definite Denby and uh, uh, Flint uh, streak in uh, Find My Past uh, with Ellie as well, also having uh, some relatives there. So uh, you're in good company. And uh, so uh, the last thing to talk about in our uh, march through all of our new records are, of course, our newspapers. We had so many newspapers every single week, a uh, huge collection of new titles 
and these titles are from all corners of the globe and that's useful for everyone whether their ancestors migrated or if something's reported in a foreign paper you'll now be able to find it even if it was local and there are plenty of things that happen so we've got the government gazette from india from 1801 to 1802 and 1804 to 1832 lots and lots of colonial relations might be in there uh, the Sleaford Gazette's a little bit uh, nearer to home, 1858 to 1870, 1872 to 1887, 1889 to 1893, 1895 to 1960, so getting more modern. We've got The Sun, not the one that you'll pick up uh, nowadays, but the one from Antigua, uh, which I'm guessing is a lot warmer. Uh, 1912, that one is from. And the Overland China Mail, 1853 to 1861. 1863 to 1894, 1897 to 1915, the Birkenhead and Cheshire Advertiser, 1877, 1880, 1883 to 1885, 1889, 1910 and 1912, the Beverly Independent, these are all brand new titles for the first time they've been on the British Newspaper Archive and Find My Past, the Blandford Weekly News, the Weekly Independent of Bromsgrove, 1886, 1891, the Dominica Dial, uh, 1883 to 1890. The Hearn Bay Press, uh, 1913 to 1918. And the Antigua Observer, 1884 and 1870 to 1903. So those are the new titles, 11 brand new titles from all over the place. And then we've got new pages to 19 other papers. The Manchester Evening News, 1926, 1950 to 51, 54 to 55 and 58. Ashbourne Telegraph. The Cinematograph, which is a fantastic newspaper that talks about all of the days of early screen, uh, 1951. That goes in a large collection we've already got. The Bromsgrove and Droitwich Messenger, the Winsford Chronicle, the Fleetwood Chronicle, the Stratford Express, the American Register, the War, 1914, which I have a sneaking suspicion that might be related to a very large event going on at that sort of point. Uh, Chelsea News and General Advertiser, the Utoxeter Advertiser at Ashbourne Times, the Caithness Courier, the Carmarthen Journal, the Manchester and Salford Advertiser, the Voice of India, the Dundee Weekly News, the Nairnshire Telegraph and General Advertiser for the Northern Counties, Budget from Jamaica, 1879 to 1880, 1887 to 1888, and a massive one from New Zealand, the Littleton Times, 1854 to 1898, with a few little gaps in there. Um, big span of records there. Um, so a really big collection of newspapers this week. And don't forget that even if your local newspaper hasn't been mentioned, there's still a great chance that your ancestors might be mentioned in the stories contained inside these. And uh, do keep looking back and making the same searches because of this. I try and do it once a month and see if something new has appeared. And I've been very lucky in that way as well. Um, so um, we have a, a question relating to newspapers. Why do your newspaper archive never come up as hints from Andrew? Um, that's because if you look at newspapers, and this is why they're in a separate search, and this is really important to remember, that um, it's very difficult to know. We're, we're people, and we have this bit of intelligence that a computer never can copy and never can really replicate. Um, we understand if we talk about someone called uh, Laura Bush, that's their name. However, if you type Laura Bush into the newspapers, and because it's free text, we transcribe all the text that we can, anything, you'll get people called Laura talking about gardening and things like that because of the word Bush and all kinds of other things. So it's, it's more difficult to know when someone's talking about a name. As people, it's really easy for us to spot the names and we can do that. But then there are other things that a computer just can't quite get just in the same way. It might do in a few years' time, so you know, definitely keep your eyes peeled, and things are advancing all the time, so never say never, but that's why we have so many, you know, millions of pages, tens of millions of pages, and all of those, we, you can search through every single bit of text rather than um, the names are extracted. We have extracted names in some places. The Gazette you will find on our website and that has names extracted. That's really useful. But for other things that can be a little more colloquial, a little more local, a little more sort of full of these local references that a computer doesn't quite understand the way we do, uh, that makes it a little harder. Never say never, though, and fingers crossed there'll be more developments in the coming years. We're in a wonderful cutting-edge time for family history where these things can keep developing, but uh, that's why. So that's why you have to think a little bit outside the box as well, Perhaps, particularly if you have some of those ancestors with names that are also things. So uh, any colour names, so we have, you know, uh, brown, black, uh, green, etc., can be a little difficult. Uh, those people, I know people with the surname Church and the like can uh, struggle a little, but there are other ways you can do at that and uh, there are um, a few presentations that you can take a look at one that i did for roots tech which i know someone's 
spoke about just a second ago. So I'll come back to that. Uh, about different ways you can search the British newspaper archive and that is still online on their website if you want to take a look and that's free to watch so uh, take a look at that if you need some technical search tips on how to uh, exclude and include certain things and maybe we'll have to uh, replay we'll have to do a, a re visit of that at some point uh, on the farmer pass page as well and uh, see how we go so uh, let's take a look at uh, things. So I know someone mentioned uh, Roots Tech and uh, I've, I've missed, uh, I remember reading it. There we go. So uh, it was Janine who said it. Um, International Roots Tech is next week. It's virtual and free. Uh, she posted a link, but I think um, it's quite a long one. So I can't really read that out. Um, I think uh, it's rootstech.org, I believe, is the, the main page. Uh, it's a free event. Uh, you register and then um, the doors will open. And I think there are something like over a thousand presentations um, and uh, you can just go to any that you like and you can watch at your heart's content at your leisure uh, and maybe pick up some new tips or ideas about things that might be of interest. Uh, I know uh, my colleague Brian Donovan is doing some great presentations about Irish research uh, and I'm doing some uh, getting you started in Scottish records as well. I'm doing three talks about that. Uh, but there's many different things there, many things that might be of interest. And because, of course, it's free, always worth a look. So that's something we recommend as well. And you don't have to watch things exactly on the day. Uh, you can uh, register, you can visit, and you've got three days to look. And the videos themselves are up for about a year, so you've got much more time to go back in. In those three days, though, you can ask questions. They have little chat rooms, and you can talk to the presenters. So that's worth uh, doing, an opportunity to ask your questions in there. Um, so uh, I'm seeing all of you uh, talking amongst yourselves about these different things, and that's fantastic. That's great. Um, I see... Um, uh, Stacey's excited by the Sleaford newspapers, and it's a time period where her, her great grandfather was born illegitimately there. So that's a good one. Definitely get to those and see what's there. Um, Nicole has a question. Uh, how could I find out if my three times great grandfather married my three times great grandmother? I can't find any records of them being married at all, just stating on census records they were married. He was with another woman before my three times great grandmother. But I can't even find a record of marriage to him either. This would be late 1800s in Wales. So First of all, I would start by trying to find the um, the death or burial of the first wife, because that will narrow down your span of where you need to look. Um, and that could help a little bit. If you're talking late 1800s, then you've got civil registers. I'm guessing if we're in Wales, there might be a more common name. and There might be lots to choose from. Um, so that makes things a little harder. Um, the Welsh collection on Farmer Past is the most comprehensive parish records collection uh, of, uh, for Wales online. And uh, that's definitely worth a look because there are lots of those parish records that go up to the early 20th century. So look for those marriages because then you don't have to pay for a certificate because it's exactly the same from 1837 onwards. If you find a parish marriage, it's the same as the marriage that you would get if you paid and you ordered that marriage certificate. So that's going to save you some money. And the same goes for all of the parish records you can find with images. So that's really useful. Um, but I, I, I mean, common law marriage happened fairly frequently in Scotland. Um, less so in England, um, I would have expected there might have been something and it may be the fact that we're just trying to sift through the records. So start with those parish records, narrow down your span uh, by said finding what happened to the first wife um, and uh, then you've got a census where they appear as well. So you might have a very narrow sort of band that you can look for and that might even just narrow down the number of marriages that you might have to order if you can't get the parish record certificates and maybe there might be two or three or something and you might have to gamble a little bit and see what happens and just get fingers crossed but that's why i would start with and that might help you a little bit so um let's take a look that's what else we've got I see uh, lots of people talking about utah it's uh, uh, a great part of the world but salt lake city and uh, then people talk about draper as well um, I think Salt Lake City is, is possibly one of the places I've been to most in my life. Uh, and uh, every time it's always there's something new to find and see. And of course, the greatest thing is that family history library where you can spend weeks in there uh, researching all kinds of things. So it is exciting. And uh, then uh, speaking of common names, uh, our own Ellie is doing the comments to say she's got Jones, Davis and many, many more Welsh surnames. Those are the names that we all uh, sort of secretly dread but there are ways around it maybe we should have to do another talk about uh, keeping up with the joneses and separating out those common names and finding things because that's one of those things that does happen quite a lot 
and uh, um, Fiona is saying, uh, watch out for the list of undigitized Welsh parishes in the Welsh Collection information page, and you go to the local archives for those. There are some parishes that aren't included, uh, and you won't find them online at all, and that's because, of course, these are someone else's records, and it's up to them if they allow the records to be scanned. Um, and uh, that has you know, slowly changed. Some have uh, later on decided that they do want to include their collections, um, and then others yes, they're still only in the archive. So if you go to any record page, uh, you go to find them in the all record sets in the collection. And on the left hand side on that page, you'll see exactly that. You'll see that list of coverage that you get for many records, especially the parish collections, telling you which years are covered, which parishes, and that will give you a clue if you're finding no results, why that might be. Is it because the records don't exist or they're not included? Uh, or anything else and maybe you know it might not be the fact that your person's not there it might be the fact that the records aren't there so that's one thing to remember as well and that's one uh, very good point and so uh, let's see what else we have going in um and uh, I see, you see Karen's got uh, Smith and Brown from Scotland and that's that's it it's a nightmare it is Brown especially in Scotland is quite a few and uh, a few other people uh, Nicole has solved the Davis mystery and now they're working on Williams so it looks like we all are going for this so this is the one uh, and uh, Nicole has uh, Jones Evan Smith and Lewis in her trees and Sue has tried searching but um, hasn't had much luck and the names are useful though and um uh, last year, Beth managed to trace her family to Anglesey, uh, found some direct ancestors in the local graveyard, uh, and they have Edwards, Jones, Smith, Griffiths, and a few more common surnames, so quite a few of those. And that brings us, I think, to that question of the week uh, that we asked. So we asked, um, what's your biggest genealogy mystery that you think is almost within reach of solving? You know, when you think, if I could just find that one record that I'm sure is there, but I can't get to it, or something like that, that would help. It would just break down that brick wall and mean that you're you're there. You you've got the answer, and I think everyone's got one. That you know, there are plenty of genealogical mysteries and brick walls that we might find we'll never get the answer. We might think, oh, that must be impossible, and maybe in in time, but it's something that we we put to the back of our mind while we focus on the the more doable problems and and questions. But is there something that you know? If there's just one thing, like perhaps uh, I know of a couple of people who are waiting for the uh, archives to reopen after um, the uh, lockdowns and things because they know there's a record in there that might open up all kinds of doors and so it's almost within reach but not quite there but uh, there are definitely definitely a few of these uh, in my own family tree and there are lots in yours as well it seems so um, we have uh, Jane and we asked the question before and said if you've got more answers do put them in the chat as we go now um, her great grandfather Samuel Brownlow might have been born Samuel Brownlow then at some not some point his middle name joined up with his surname don't know if this happened to others he remains a bit of a mystery um, it's possible it's plausible um, you'd have to lay out that life um, and uh, look at every single fact and every record and see if you can spot something like that. And that's an interesting thing. And also, of course, uh, make sure it might be a, a transcription error or something like that as well. So take a look and explore um, and just uh, look at the original record and see if there is a space between those letters and words. Um, and uh, we've got uh, Karen's three times great grandfather. Uh, she knows all about him except who his parents are. He was born 1812, but she can't find his baptism. Uh, Sydney Dyer is his name. She's trying to use DNA to help, and the name's quite unusual, so you'd think you'd be able to find him. That's one of those things, isn't it? When we get to that person that's, uh, you know, the the start of our family tree at some point, just on the on the tip of the of the tree top, and um, we uh, we need to find you know where they're born and things like that, and we have the details, and we go, where are they? What's going on? Um, yeah, it's uh, it's interesting as to where they may have come from originally, perhaps not in that parish, perhaps, or perhaps they are in that parish and uh, for some reason the records aren't there. I find if I know the rough area and I know the year that someone is born, I'll browse through parish books online and I'll go through page by page and try and see if someone's just not been transcribed or missed or some reason or misspelled. Even sometimes the handwriting can be terrible and so that might be a reason. But if I browse through, then I can be sure they're not in these books and see if there's any kind of gaps. Um, I see um, uh, some more as I go through some of the old ones. Um, we've got... Um, Kim uh, has already solved one. It took 12 years, and then the next one came along straight away. <laughs> and that's how it always happens, isn't it? Um, and 
this one appears to be unsolvable, but she's only four years in, so so maybe one day. Uh, Marianne Fuchsia, um, born, baptized in London as Marianne Fuchsia in 1885, but never birth registered, disappeared in 1910, never to be seen or heard from again. Oh, that's interesting. I would be looking at passenger lists for that, and I would also look at a 1911 census with a few different uh, wild cards and uh, things like that to see if perhaps something's been misspelled or mistranscribed or misread. And misheard even if it was uh, copied by the enumerator because um in that case you know we might have a, a little bit of a uh, a difference so we've already seen that their name has changed a little bit it might be reverted or it might be changing again as we've seen that it happened once so there's there's a few things i would start looking at but uh, it sounds like perhaps also the 1921 census will be of great use to you and that's hopefully just around the corner so keep your eyes peeled for that and that might be the one so hopefully it won't take you 12 years maybe uh, you know uh, four is uh, something we can keep it at that and we can keep it at a nice uh, easy one i say easy but it won't take you as long um uh, Janine has asked, is it common for children to be born in one place and baptised in another? It does happen. It happens uh, for a number of reasons. Perhaps you want to be baptised in a particular church. Maybe it's a church from your family um, that's you know, related to you know, your other relatives and they wanted to go back to that church. Perhaps also, I mean, sometimes it was cheaper to baptise in one church than another. Uh, or you know, someone may have been born while the family was away from home. There are lots of reasons, um, and so it does happen. Uh, often in those baptismal records, you'll see where that person is from. So if they're not from the parish, they'll make a note of it, and that's an important thing to see as well. And then also there is, um, you'll find uh, some parishes contain a number of uh, different settlements. So you'll have villages that don't have their own church. So people will be baptized in the parish church, but it's not in their town because their town doesn't have a church. So there are a few different reasons why someone could be baptized in a place that they're not from. Um, and uh, so uh, definitely uh, read every piece of those records to find out more. And uh, so uh, I see uh, Graham is trying to find a three times great grandfather, Thomas Roberts from Overton, married to a Mary Price, had their first child in 1829. Was he born in 1816? Oh, that's quite close, isn't it? That seems a little too close. He had another brother, also a Thomas, born 1798, which is more feasible, but I have him married to another person with a different line of children. Thomas Roberts, we said we, we might definitely have to do a common surname uh, session. Um, that's a that's something that I think maybe there may be more Thomas Roberts to look at, and there might be some unraveling to do. I would say um, a thirteen year old with a child and a wife, because they would have you know, married first, and that sort of thing is is quite unlikely. Um, and so I would say there's definitely something that needs unraveling there. Um, and so uh, start with uh, all of the Thomas Roberts in the area, and start sort of um, marrying them off or uh, dispatching them as you find the records and see who's left and see what you can find and see what needs unraveling. But uh, it sounds like there definitely is something there that might need a little bit of working with. And uh, Julia said she's browsed so many Devon Parish records and my ancestors not to be found. I think as his parents travelled around looking for work, they never got around to baptising my two times great grandfather. Um, Devon was a, a, quite a hub of uh, non-conformism uh, at that sort of point. Uh, so, uh, Julie, you might want to look at our non-conformist registers. We've got some great ones from Devon, um, and there may be Methodist records or uh, Baptists or anything like that that um, might help you in that. Um, so I would look at those too. Uh, I found a few Cornish ancestors who've done that. They started an established church, and the families moved over to Methodism, something like that and you'll find them in a different set of baptismal records. So that would be one thing I would look at for that. And uh, uh, let's see, so Renee has asked, uh, were there records of adoptions in the past? Uh, not in the distant past, no. It wasn't a formal process, so you won't really find much. The more recent past, yes, but those records are now mostly covered by privacy rules, so you won't find them online. If it's your adoption or you're the next of kin, then the local council might be able to help you or the place that you were adopted from or or the place that uh, was involved in this adoption. And uh, you'd have to get in touch with them. But in, online, I don't think you'll find too much. So uh, yeah, it's a very uh, difficult part of research to, to go through. 
um, Anya has cousins who were baptised twice, once in the Church of Scotland and once in the Church of Latter-day Saints. I think they were hedging their bets. Well, I mean, it depends which order. Uh, there are many people who convert uh, each each time, uh, you know, through their lifetimes. Um, and uh, so we've got records of that. And you can then see, you know, it gives you a good clue uh, of the faith that the children may have. And so um, it's uh, a very uh, interesting thing to find and a good one. And in Scotland, quite often, uh, less so. Um, com, you know, conversion to the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but the um, free churches and um, other different churches that are of similar denomination um, that some people would just go to a nearby church and, and not be as um, concerned as to which church that is. So there are Episcopalians, uh, free church records, all kinds of things, and they're all sort of bundled together. And so... Uh, you can uh, maybe take a look at some of these other denominations and uh, again then if you can't find your ancestor in the normal established parish records look at these and they might help you a lot so um let's see what else we've got um jackie's asking if there's a historical event they haven't discovered yet they relocated their ancestors and that's a really big point about trying to find the um the social and historic context to everything to underpin what we're researching because that is the way uh, that we can spot those big events uh, one of the big things that i do which i find really useful if my ancestors disappear there are lots and lots of gazetteers there are a few um on from my past and you can look by location by place um, but there are many many others online because there are very old books usually and you're looking for the old ones that's the important bit try and find a gazetteer from when your ancestor was there and from just afterwards or from when they seem to disappear from that area. It will usually describe the area and tell you about decent recent changes. So things like change in population, industries that have risen or collapsed, uh, reasons for different changes as well. And it might give you a clue, it might give you an idea. Um, maybe it will say that uh, there was a, a clay industry and then that's sort of decimated when uh, a local factory opened and all the people were thrown out of business or something like that all those things could be included and also i'd look at contemporary maps not the modern ones and not the very old ones um, look for one about the same time especially look for one just before and just after in the same way if a new road or new railway has been built follow the path of that and look at the different towns and villages in the pathway of that and that might give you a clue as to where someone might have been because it just suddenly became much easier to travel to the next town over and so they may have gone somewhere like that and so um, overwhelmingly they tend to go from somewhere more rural to more urban so if you're in a village look in towns if they're in towns look in cities and go for that but of course our ancestors always the exception to the rule uh, so don't discount anything and examine every single record so we're seeing lots and lots of uh allison has then has again got a william williams a david davis and a griffith griffiths in wales i feel your pain allison and um, that's uh a one that's going to take some definite work and uh, that's uh yeah that's going to be a, a tough one but don't give up look at as many records as you can and definitely be uh some that we can go through uh, Lorraine's also got some William Williamses two on different sides of the family crikey and that's that's one um, and uh, a point uh, Julia makes uh, that uh, LDS baptisms wouldn't be before the age of eight so that's a interesting point to remember when we're looking at family history if you are looking at a uh, denomination or faith that you haven't come across before in your family tree or for your family heritage try and understand all of the processes and rituals that uh, make part of that faith so that you can uh, get to grips with certain ages for example in catholic faith you know, confirmations um communion uh, when these things took place so you know when you'd be looking for those kind of records uh, and that can really help to narrow down where we're looking for these different collections so that's a really very good point julia um, and uh, so there are lots and lots of you talking again it's really great we've got about 25 minutes to go uh, any more of your uh, answers to the question of the week would be great so which of those uh, the things you have just the brick walls are just on the edge the ones that you're about to solve and there's something that you can think of uh, and uh, see what we can find maybe we can have some 
answers together. Uh, Sue has two times uh, great great grandfather's birth and marriage records, but can't find where to access the Kirk records for Curry or Collington near Edinburgh. The marriage is in Grass Market in Edinburgh. Lots of churches there need the Kirk records. Mm, so I think is it the the records of the Kirk session you're looking for? So hopefully they'll be around relatively soon. So I hear. So um, there are a few on Farmer Pass that have been indexed, but I hear that you might be able to look through all of them at some point soon um, online. So that that will be very useful. Um, and so uh, keep your fingers crossed. And the grass market is a wonderful part of Edinburgh. It's one of the most magical. It's one of the reasons why I came here, because I used to come and uh, at night I would, from my hotel, uh, when I came up for work, I would just go for a wander around the grass market because it was just it was wonderful. It's like going back in time. It's fantastic. So uh, I, I love that part of Edinburgh more than anywhere. So it's uh, great to imagine that your ancestors were married there because all those buildings are really still there. So that's uh, a great thing to look at. And uh, we see lots and lots of other uh, different questions and answers and people discussing uh, coming in. Uh, really, really exciting. I have my own where I have two uh, children. Um, and I know from someone who's looking, it's in a will mentioned their siblings. Uh, I know the ages of the siblings. So I found them in other records and when they're born from the censuses, but I can't find the parish they're born in at all. So I'm looking for two or three siblings, uh, all the surname Roberts, unfortunately, a John Roberts, a Frederick Roberts, and uh, I think it's a Walter Roberts, all born in the same parish to the same parents, same mother and father. Um, and uh, every list of three I can find that are in a parish, they all have different parents. So I'm really struggling for that. So that's my, my brick wall that's almost there. I need to sit down and get a spreadsheet and try and work that out. Maybe it's always, maybe this weekend is the weekend, but maybe at some point we'll do it. Um, but uh, there we go. So uh, we see um, Andrew has said the First Communion comes for confirmation the Catholic faith. Yes, it does. We've got a massive collection of Catholic records, uh, including a lot of confirmations, and those confirmations will also include the date of uh, First Communion. There are lots of other supplementary congregational records in these collections, um, so definitely take a look at those. Uh, if you know the faith of your ancestors, you can find some details there. Um, and uh, Linda said the grass has got some great pubs too. It does. It, a very, very old ones. It's amazing. I think it's one of them. Is it the Black Bull, I think, or something like that, um, which is the place where I think it was Shakespeare and Oliver Cromwell and all kinds of famous people have sat. Uh, and that's a fantastic feeling, isn't it, that someone's been there before you that's had such an impact on the world. Um, and that's uh, something that you, you can really connect with history. There's a cafe in Vienna. Uh, it's called Cafe Central. And if you ever go, uh, maybe when all this is over, it's really worth going. Um, it's good to book because they can have a queue. Um, it's not that expensive, but they do amazing cakes. So do the Sasha talk that I'm sure anyone who goes to Vienna has to have. Um, and it's a coffee house. Um, so they do cakes and they do food. But it used to be um, a little cheaper. And the Viennese culture was where you would, uh, you would buy a pot of coffee and they would refill it and you would spend the whole day sitting in there reading the newspaper. And in this place, um, uh, Sigmund Freud used to go there. Um, Hitler used to go there, um, Lenin, um, uh, Trotsky, uh, Stalin, um, many, many other people all congregated in this cafe and uh, or maybe would recognize each other many years later when they were uh, doing things on the world stage. Uh, there's a, a rumor. Um, it's a story that's never been proven, but um, apparently when uh, Joseph Stalin uh, heard about uh, Adolf Hitler rising to power um, and seeing uh, his picture, he said, is that the guy from the cafe? And so no one knows if that's true or not. It's one of those weird sort of things, but it's an interesting story, this idea. Um, a lot of them didn't speak the same language, so they maybe didn't have conversations, but it's interesting. They might have been sat on the same table many years before all of the events of the 20th century that are also pivotal in, so that's really interesting. And it is fascinating how, uh, again, history is around us. We don't even notice. We can be sat in the places all these people have been. Uh, we never really know what's occurred, and so it's a fascinating thing. And... Um, so, yeah, we, uh, we've got so much um, that is around us. And uh, Anya said, was it not the White Hart Inn that was the pub in the grass market? And there is a White Hart Inn there as well. I, I know that one. Um, there are lots. It sounds like we're all quite big fans of the grass market. Maybe when this is all over, that's the place we need to congregate. <laughs> we need to gather, have a live Find My Path gathering. 
Um, I know we actually talked, um, Ellie and I, in a little bit of a daily exercise that we're allowed. We went for a little walk around the old parts of Edinburgh and some of the old cemeteries and things. And we did discuss and maybe uh, let us know if you think this is a good idea. And it, it's got all kinds of recipes for going wrong. So we might have to see how it goes. But um, maybe doing a, if, if rules allow, a sort of a, a guided tour through uh, Find My Past Live of some of the historic sites of Edinburgh, some of the old cemeteries, perhaps, and talking about some of the people in there. So and that could be something that might be of interest. That means you can explore a little bit from home and maybe some of the old stories that we know about. And so that could be really good. Um, but let us know if you if you think that's a good idea. And uh, maybe we'll, we'll see if we can get that arranged. And uh, uh, definitely as the weather's a bit better than uh, something that we could look at in more detail. And uh, I see Karen is ready to apply for a granddad's service records. It's the only way they might be able to break that brick wall. If you can find your ancestor's service record, um, definitely uh, get hold of it because it's, uh, it's full of all kinds of detail. Uh, it takes a while to arrive, but definitely worth it. Uh, Linda said as well, don't give up. Uh, it took almost 20 years to find a grandfather's birth registration, even though they knew when and where. They finally cracked it by finding the great grandmother on a passenger list after marrying a different guy, or so we thought. Turns out the great grandfather joined the army, posted abroad. The great grandmother joined him, had two kids, and then the great grandfather deserted the army, changed the family name, returned to the UK, and had many more kids with the new name. All tracked with the new name now. That's it, exactly. One record can open the door. I have a, um, a cousin uh, who disappeared from my family completely uh, her name was mary aline wilshin and i thought well that's a name that i should be able to find i don't understand where she'd gone and for years she just disappeared she was on the census and then she vanished uh, just like some of these that people are talking about and it turns out that one passenger list opened this i found her on a passenger list uh, listed as mary alice uh, so which is why she didn't pop up straight away and in brackets, it said, also known as Sunday. And then when I found that, I found that Sunday Wilshin uh, became a very uh, well-known uh, little film starlet of uh, stage and screen. She was in an Alfred Hitchcock movie. Uh, she's got photos in the National Portrait Gallery. Um, she became the announcer that took over from um, uh, the, it's, um, oh, uh, I always get the wrong one, is it? Uh, Orson Welles or HG Wells, I can't remember, but as the uh, an India announcer for the BBC. She was a BBC producer until the 1980s um, and doing a lot of radio. And uh, there are uh, many, many stories and things that I found. I found photographs of her in movies. I found different things. I haven't yet been able to see any of these because they're quite hard to track down. Uh, but uh, that one record opened the door. So this is by no means unique. There are so many of these different uh, individual records that can just open that and unlock everything. So keep looking. And of course, as we keep adding records, you've got more and more chance of that happening. So that's really exciting too. Um, so uh, Cheryl is saying that their DNA doesn't say Irish or Welsh, but some Scottish. That's an interesting thing. When you look at those pie charts, and this is a really big thing to remember when you're doing any kind of DNA research and you get those uh, pie charts from different websites and things that say you're X percent this and that. It's interesting and it's perhaps something to bear in mind, but take it with a little bit of a pinch of salt. Think about the paper and the records and try and connect some proof to it because of the way that it works and you compare you compare populations they might not be that that accurate in some different populations different areas and uh, sometimes they might confuse certain things for certain other things uh, and as you know when you look at these things over time your percentage will change as things get more accurate which shows of course you know perhaps if you saw the first one and you were half norwegian and you thought oh maybe i have to have a talk with my mum or my dad um actually it might be because they've confused maybe yorkshire dna with that or something like that and later on you'll find it changing and you you become you know maybe two percent norwegian 30 percent from yorkshire and all this sort of thing so there's there's all kinds of different things um that alter over time uh, as these things get more accurate but don't take that pie chart as the law uh, always look at records and paperwork and that's the way that you can approve or disprove your family history theories and then use the dna to support that and to maybe find connections between cousins and things that can work backwards to the same names to prove that you're on the right track so uh we've got here so we've got uh you know stacy saying what a great story about sunday i mean i think she's i don't know she might have a wikipedia page but if not if you google her you can see many pictures of her um and um she's uh, i think she's buried somewhere in essex i think in braintree or somewhere like that and uh, 
uh, yes, um, I never knew her or anything. I think she's a second cousin, something once removed. Um, but uh, it was interesting to find that bit of story. And I've definitely sort of found her on IMDb and all kinds of things. And it's great to find someone with so many photographs as well. So that's quite good. And um, Anya said she's found more military records on Farmer Pass than anywhere else. We do have a big collection. Definitely go through those categories and look through um, every category as well. And when you're looking at military records, if you know the service number of your ancestor, and you find it from one record, go to that category search, enter the service number, and enter maybe just the surname, and then, or even just the first letter of the surname and use an asterisk, and then you'll find all the people with that service number in all the records and with that surname. Uh, or the beginning of that letter, because many service uh, records and many different documents that relate to military service don't have things like location of birth. And so this will be the way to narrow it down and know that you've got the right person. You might find medal index cards, you might find you know, details of people being wounded. All those things are really useful if you do that. So that's a good one there. Uh, was Sunday born on Sunday? That's something I'm now going to have to check. I'll get back to you, Ursula. Um, it will be interesting. I mean, it's definitely a stage name and a half. So let's see. Um, and uh, we can go from there. But uh, that's now you've given me something to research. Uh, Gillian managed to get a copy of her dad's record. His national service with a black watch. It's a place in Glasgow. That's interesting. Um, I got a, a, a cousin's service record uh, when uh, at uh, Roots Tech London, the, the government, the Ministry of Defence had a booth and they were giving them, uh, it was a very interesting sort of one-off uh, where they were, you could uh, order this service record and it would arrive by the next day. And so I got a cousin's service record from the Second World War um, and it was full of detail, just like the ones we see for the First World War, but carrying on. And uh, if you can, and it said it will take you some time for it to arrive, but it's worth putting uh, that uh, application in because you don't know what might be inside. And there might be hundreds of pages of things that will be really, really useful. Karen's asked, if her grandfather served in both wars, would he have had two different service numbers? He would have a different service number if he changed regiment or, or something like that. But if he um, if he was in the same one and carried the same service, then I think it would be the same. Um, but I imagine in two wars, he would be sort of re-enlisted. So they, he would be having a new uh, number. Uh, so take a look. The best thing to look for is the um, service the, the medal index card, which gives you a list of those service uh, numbers, one after another for each individual if they change. Um, my own uh, great grandfather used to think about three different service numbers as he moved between different regiments. And so you see them all listed and you have to look for all of them when you're looking as well, just to make sure because different things might come through. And so that's worth looking at as well. Uh, Nicole has, has added uh, maybe some uh, uh, more uh, impetus to looking at when Sunday was born. Uh, her mother's half-siblings all have the day they were born as one of their middle names. That's interesting. That's really good. Um, so uh, definitely it's nice to have a tradition, isn't it? Uh, Marion said, Farmer Pass did a great session on Army personnel a few months ago explaining about service numbers. So all of our uh, presentations are available on our video collection they're on our youtube channel and they're also on um our facebook page in our video section so go back and take a look at any that you fancy any topic that takes your fancy go for it and see what's there so you might find some new things and extra tips uh, maybe we didn't watch the welsh presentation because we didn't have welsh answers at that point and now we found some we can go back and we can look anytime they're still there for you so they're very very useful to go back uh, it's a library for your uh digestion at any point in time so uh, definitely go back and see where you can and uh, Anya said the Black Watch Museum in Perth gave her some help with his her five times great grandfather in the 42nd Regiment of Foot so the 42nd Regiment of Foot is far earlier uh, and uh, that's good because all these regiments they will move between the different uh, names or amalgamate or separate and things like that so it is important to uh, start with wikipedia and things like that and find out what these regiments were and where they were and things like that um the cameron highlanders is my my grandfather's regiment and that was i think it's now the queen's own highlanders or something like that i think they merged with the uh, seaforth highlanders and um for their 70th wedding anniversary just uh, um, last month, for my grandparents, I tried to get uh, the Cameron Highlanders or the new regiment to send a piper, um, and um, we couldn't because of the lockdown. But um, we had to sort of follow through 
uh, the path of which is the new regiment and everything that went along. So uh, it's uh, it's interesting when you can do that. And that's uh, usually on Wikipedia, something like that you can just follow through. Uh, but then you find the right museum, the regimental archive, and the regimental historians or archivists are really knowledgeable. They're always really useful. Uh, send them an email or give them a call, and they can sometimes point you in the right direction if you can't find records like that uh, online. And uh, Claire, as I said, consistent surname spelling is the exception for those centuries. Search all surname variants. That's really true. Um, literacy really only exploded in the late 1800s, 1870s onwards, really, was when people had to start having proper schooling. And outside of that, they would have education in Sunday school and usually not much else, um, particularly if they were working class uh, or sort of lower middle class. So um, be prepared to use those wildcards as much as you can. And for those of you who don't, know what wild cards are because we talk about them and they are the thing that you should really most get to grips with in family history in a digital database because that's what this is um you can use a question mark for a letter that you're not sure what it might be um you can replace that letter with a question mark and it will give you anything that comes through with any letter there or you can use a asterisk and that asterisk will mean that there might be something here, but I'm not sure. And I don't know how long it is. And I don't know if it's even there. And so you can do that. So for my surname, Cleland, with two L's, sometimes it has one L. So I put an asterisk in there and it will give me all of the Clellands and it will give me all the Clellands with one L as well. Because it says, well, actually there isn't a, a thing there. So we'll use the asterisk to tell me. I'll look for the things without as well. Um, sometimes, uh, so Cleland, the A, as uh, for a generation, changed to an O. Uh, so I can put a, a question mark in there and I can then find all of the A's that are listed as O's. And this also means not just uh, as you talk about, uh, you know, uh, people uh, with literacy uh, and Claire says, you know, this, this spelling of surnames, but it can also be the transcription of surnames because some letters look very similar, particularly in handwriting that people might not recognize. So some of these letters might just be misread. So there's that to think about as well. So those asterisks and those question marks, those wildcards will really help you when you're looking for records. So definitely use those as well. Don't just rely on that surname variance tag or the name variance. It's useful and it's definitely a good first point. But if you want to really upgrade that searching, start using those wildcards and learn for your surname where to put those wildcards in to get the best results. It's really good. Um, so we're seeing this. So uh, we're seeing other people saying they've used that. Um, there's uh, a poem I can see there. Uh, it's Edinburgh based Burke and Hare. They were a pair, killed a wife and didn't care. Then they put her in a box and sent her off to Dr. Knox. Burke's the butcher, Hare's the thief, Knox the one who buys the beef. So uh, that's an interesting one. That's one of those stories. One of my um, favorite stories of sort of local Edinburgh is Deacon Brody. He's interesting. If you want to take a look at that, um, it's one of those great tales of someone who just wanted a bit of a thrill. He was a cabinet maker um, and he uh, was a very well respected, very rich, you know, well to do kind of guy uh, who made these ornate, wonderful cabinets that all the middle class and the upper class wanted to buy. And uh, so he sold them to them. But what he would do is keep a copy of the keys. And then when he thought they were out, he'd go and he'd steal all the things from the cabinets and he would keep going. So he had a life of crime as well as a uh, a life as a, an artisan. Uh, and he was eventually caught. And he was uh, one of those people that, uh, again, said it had uh, quite a story to him. So he's worth taking a look at as well. Um, and uh, that's something to maybe one day they'll make a movie of and uh, they'll go from there. Um, he just uh, did it for the excitement rather than the money. Uh, so it's an interesting tale, but uh, it's, it's one to see. Uh, Anita's asked a good question. How do I look up double barreled names? So because we're not quite sure how these things might have been recorded and how people might have read them, um, try everything. So try with a double barrel name with a dash. Try uh, with a space. And try these surnames, and also try the first barrel of your name as a middle name as well, just in case they've re recorded the surname and they've put that first barrel in the start. So I've got ancestors uh, called Hunter Blairs, and uh, Hunter Blair can be uh, with a, a, a dash. It can be Hunter Blair, as in the Hunter and Space Blair in that surname. Sometimes it's Hunter as a middle name, and they're listed as Blair surname. So uh, try all three of those. And hopefully one of those will get you to those uh, double barrel names. So there we go. Um, 
Cheryl's asked, uh, can we find a link to the wild cards and that will come? Um, uh, I'm sure Ellie uh, will have some great things she's just posted. Uh, and Jackie's also said that World War II Royal Navy records are still classified, only available for the Ministry of Defence. All service records, all branches after 1920 are still without Ministry of Defence. Um, I had a rejection from Forces website and then opened a box of my late father's documents and found the service record in there. <laughs> Training notes, letters, lots more. Uh, guess what you've been doing? Well, hopefully transcribing all of those and getting all the information out of that. So that would be really, really interesting. As I said, um, Ellie has posted that great link there to those uh, wildcard things. So if you can find that link, take a look and that will help you. Um, Ursula was asking about the, uh, I think it's the the deacon. Um, uh, his name is William Brody. Deacon Brody, they called him. Um, if you take a look in Google or something like that, you'll be able to find more details about him. It's an interesting story. I do like a good uh, story to go through. I'm just saying, wasn't Jekyll and Hyde based on Deacon Brody? I think it might have been in part. And there's lots of different inspirations. There are other people. There's a, a man called um, Charles Peace, who's a famous criminal, it's supposed to be the inspiration for Moriarty uh, and other things from him history that have come through and become literal uh figures as well so there are many many here um and uh wow sue's uh brother-in-law's name is hale baxter sometimes with an e sometimes with an a sometimes two names exactly that's it so it's it's interesting to have uh you know um one of those names and a little easier to find some records but then you've got to arm yourself with those wild cards if you've got a rarer more interesting name i said i know um there are some some really unique names that you need to look for um i'm just thinking about how others might read and see them so uh that's the thing and uh, claire said as well uh pharma past has both the variance box of ticks and wild cards but databases not all databases have that so keep that in mind so that's very true uh if you're uh looking perhaps uh you know on some uh, other website somewhere else uh you might have to think in a different way so uh these uh wonderful great tools that we provide um aren't everywhere so remember to really familiarize yourself with the tools that you're using so you can get the best out of all of them so we've got about three minutes left and i know the time flies doesn't it It really really goes through um and uh, there's still so many of you hanging out and joining and uh, talking about family history as far as we can uh, see uh, so as i scroll through the comments more and more and more and uh, so it's uh, it's great to see um this um and uh, I see people sharing the different variants of different records they can find. That's, uh, uh, you know, it's big to keep, I time to keep a list of the different variants I found, of people I know are my surnames, and I know to look for those variants again. Uh, and I've got a sort of a default way of typing Clello with my wildcards in, so I know I'll get all of them. And so I do that when I can, when I'm looking for a big thorough search, but there are different ways to do it as well. Um, it's been lovely to uh, join with you again. So uh, I think you'll see me now every month doing at least one uh, Find My Past Friday, uh, providing you're all not sick of me. And uh, we'll talk about all kinds of great family history things. It's great that, uh, again, I said it looks like some of you have got some new uh, uh, things to try over the weekend and there are some new records for you to explore which is even better uh, join us next week again and uh, you know there'll be uh, one of my wonderful colleagues uh, who will be able to discuss next week's great records and uh, maybe next week is your one i think it'll be ellie i think perhaps who'll be doing it and uh, so that's always never one to miss and um, we've got some other great sessions as well always through the week so come back on a monday and see uh, what's cooking and uh, then uh, you know well there might be a, a great session that might give you some more tips too um and so yes it was uh, it was good to uh, be with you uh, for this hour and um i hope to see you again very very soon and uh, so uh, stay safe and uh, hopefully uh, go and uh, find some new records and new discoveries and uh, tell us all about it on that find my Pass forum and so uh, uh, hopefully we'll see you again take care and uh, enjoy your weekend. See you later. Goodbye.